my god! Oh my god! According to the latest news from the NHK Japan Broadcasting Corporation news website, at around 1833 on February 14th, the crater at the top of Sakurajima Nandake Peak in Kagoshima Prefecture erupted, and the volcanic smoke rose to 5,000 meters above the crater. The eruption caused volcanic smoke to flow northeastward. It was not until around 1 a.m. on the 15th that the volcanic ash on Sakurajima was blown away, but visibility was very poor. A large amount of volcanic ash completely covered the ground, and the weather center reminded people not to go out or drive. Residents in nearby towns were busy washing away ash that had accumulated on roads and stuck to crops. This time, it is the first eruption of Sakurajima Nandake volcano since August 2020. The weather observation station shows that the farthest point is about 40 kilometers northeast of the top of Nandake. Thank you for liking, leaving comments, subscribing and turning on the little bell, we will update every day. In addition, large volcanic blocks can be seen flying from the crater to heights of 1,000 to 1,300 meters. According to a field survey conducted on the 13th, the release of volcanic gas sulfur dioxide remained at a relatively high level at 1,400 tons per day. Additionally, in the same crater, flame reflections were observed at night using highly sensitive surveillance cameras. Turumi City, Kirishima City, Sioux City, Eira City, ISA City, Satsuma Sawachi City, Satsuma Town, and Yumazu Town all experienced large amounts of volcanic ash. The Japan Meteorological Observatory has issued an eruption alert level 3 warning around the Sakurajima crater, and urged people to be wary of large volcanic blocks and pyroclastic flows related to eruptions within a radius of about 2 kilometers from the Nandake summit crater and Showa crater. In fact, the formation of volcanoes is mainly related to the internal structure and crustal movement of the Earth. First of all, the interior of the Earth can be divided into three parts, the core, the mantle, and the crust. The core of the Earth is mainly composed of molten iron and nickel, the mantle includes the upper mantle and the lower mantle, and its main component is silicate rock. The crust is relatively weak and is mainly composed of light silica aluminum minerals. Secondly, there are many directional rising heat flows in the mantle, which transport magma to the lower crust. The magma is mainly composed of molten silicate rock. When the magma gathers to a certain scale, it will generate pressure that squeezes the Earth's crust upward. At this time, if the crust is relatively weak, magma can squeeze through the crust and form a volcanic eruption. The pyroclastic material accumulated after a volcanic eruption will gradually form a volcanic body terrain. At the same time, crustal movement, especially plate movement, is another important reason for the formation of volcanoes. In the oceanic plate subduction zone, the oceanic plate and the continental plate squeeze each other, causing the magma in the upper mantle to rise under pressure. This magma can erupt through cracks or weak areas in the crust to form volcanoes. For example, most volcanoes in the Pacific Ring of Fire were formed by the mutual extrusion of the Pacific Plate and surrounding continental plates. More importantly, plate movements can also produce island arc volcanoes. At the continental margin, the continental plate will subduct downward to the mantle transition zone, and a large amount of water will be brought into the mantle transition zone. This water rises with the hot gas, greatly lowering the melting point of the magma in the transition zone, making it easier to melt to form magma. These magmas accumulate to form island arc volcanoes. 
For example, the volcanoes in the Japanese archipelago are typical representatives of island arc volcanoes. It is worth mentioning that in addition to magma providing power, volcano formation also requires channel conditions. If the crust is relatively weak or there are fault zones, faults and other structures, magma can rise along these channels and erupt. For example, the Great Rift Valley in East Africa is a huge fault zone and is home to many active volcanoes, such as Gilimanjaro Volcano. If the crust is thick or there are no obvious fault structures, magma can only be trapped deep in the crust. In addition, the stress state of the Earth's crust also affects the formation of volcanoes. When tensile stress occurs in the Earth's crust, normal faults are easily formed, and magma can use these fault channels to rise. If the Earth's crust is in a state of compressive stress, faults tend to be thrust, which is not conducive to the rise of magma. Generally speaking, the broadening environment of mid-ocean ridges is conducive to volcano formation. Extinct volcanoes and active volcanoes have completely different levels of danger, but how should we distinguish and judge them? In fact, the key to judging the activity of a volcano lies in observing the geological record of its most recent eruption. If the geological record of the most recent eruption of a volcano is within 10,000 years, it is defined as an active volcano if the most recent eruption was between 10,000 and 100,000 years ago, it is defined as a dormant volcano if it is even older, it can be judged to be dead. Volcano Many people have questions, will an extinct volcano suddenly revive and erupt suddenly? In fact, extinct volcanoes are theoretically unlikely to erupt suddenly, but since their activity mechanisms are not fully understood, it is difficult to 100% rule out the possibility of extinct volcanoes restarting. The so-called extinct volcanoes refer to volcanoes that have not recorded eruptions for a long time. It is generally believed that if a volcano has not erupted for more than 100,000 years, it can be classified as an extinct volcano. But we need to understand that 100,000 years is still relatively short on the geological time scale. Take the history of the Earth itself, 100,000 years is just the latest ice age. The possible causes of volcano death are as follows. First, the regional plate movement pattern has changed and is no longer suitable for the formation of volcanoes. If the plate where the volcano is located no longer collides or subducts with other plates, the power source that provides magma will disappear. Secondly, the magma pipes are blocked. After the early volcanic eruption, the pipeline was filled and blocked by pyroclastic material but the pipeline could theoretically be reopened. In addition, the regional stress field changes and the original fracture system is no longer active. This could cut off the volcano's lifeline. It can be seen that among the reasons leading to the death of volcanoes, except for the fundamental changes in plate movement, death caused by other mechanisms may be temporary. Therefore, the possibility of a resurrection of extinct volcanoes is not completely impossible, especially those that have been dead for a relatively short time. Of course, the probability of an extinct volcano resurrecting is still relatively low, and the possibility of a sudden large-scale eruption without any sign is extremely small. However, we still cannot completely rule out the risk of its activation, and we need to maintain basic monitoring of some extinct volcanoes, especially those areas with active volcanoes surrounding them. In fact, according to statistical analysis of relevant observational data, global volcanic activity has increased significantly in recent decades, and the number and scale of eruptions have shown an overall increasing trend. 
Compared with the data from historical periods, the volcanic activity is obviously different from before. Specifically, first of all, since the late 1970s, the number of volcanic eruptions around the world has begun to increase significantly. The most active decades occurred from the late 1970s to the 2000s. According to geological statistics from Pennsylvania State University, in the past 10,000 years, there have been an average of 50 to 60 volcanic eruptions recorded every year around the world. In the 10 years from 1975 to 1984, there were more than 100 eruptions per year on average. From 1995 to 2004 in the past 10 years, the frequency of outbreaks has further increased to an average of more than 150 times per year. After the 21st century, although the peak period of global volcanic activity has declined, it still remains at a high level about 100 times a year. Secondly, the frequency of large volcanic eruptions with an eruption explosive index VEI greater than level 4, moderate intensity eruption, continues to increase. In the early 20th century, there were less than 10 magnitude 4 or above eruptions in the world in 10 years. But it continued to rise after the 1970s and by the 1990s, the number of magnitude 4 or above eruptions in 10 years exceeded 30. After the new millennium, the number will be around 20 times every decade, which is still significantly higher than the level in the early 20th century. In addition, the volcanology community generally believes that the Earth is experiencing a period of volcanic activity, which is mainly related to the enhanced convection of the Earth's core and mantle and changes in plate movement patterns. This trend of volcanic activity is likely to continue in the past century. We need to strengthen monitoring and research and improve disaster prevention and reduction capabilities. Volcanic eruptions can cause extremely serious disasters. The first is the direct impact of volcanic bombs and volcanic debris. When the magma in the eruption cloud is rapidly cooled, scoria will be formed. These sharp and hard fragments will be ejected from the crater at high speed due to the increase in heat and will quickly fall within nearly 10 kilometers around the volcano. The kinetic energy is huge and difficult to reach. To prevent it, it will cause fatal direct harm to people and buildings. In addition, smaller suspended particles such as volcanic ash will be produced, drifting in the air like sandstorms, seriously affecting the respiratory system. The second is the huge impact of high-temperature volcanic gas flows and lahars on surrounding areas. When the pressure in the crater cannot be controlled, High-speed airflows of hundreds of kilometers per hour will be generated to sweep across the area below the mountain. The thousand-degree heat it carries is enough to cause severe burns. What is even more serious is the ensuing volcanic mud flow. This kind of earth rock flow mixed with volcanic debris and water vapor is large and extremely fast and can submerge dozens of square kilometers of surrounding valleys in a very short time. More importantly, the mountains of volcanic ash have caused environmental pollution and a complete paralysis of outdoor traffic. A large amount of volcanic ash will quickly cover the entire volcanic area, just like thick black snow. All outdoor facilities will soon be completely covered by sticky volcanic ash roads and runways will be impassable, and railway tracks and overhead wires will break and collapse under the weight. This would completely paralyze transportation systems in the area surrounding the volcano. What cannot be ignored is that a very serious eruption will also cause extensive damage to indoor mechanical and electrical facilities due to the intrusion of volcanic ash. 
Dust particles and corrosive gases in volcanic ash can quickly invade various types of indoor precision equipment, causing permanent damage to them and plunging the entire city into an irrecoverable technological collapse. In addition, incidents of volcanic ash collapsing buildings also occur from time to time. It is worth mentioning that the most far-reaching impact of volcanic eruptions lies in their huge climate impact. Many high-intensity eruptions in history have led to global climate anomalies called volcanic winters. After a large amount of eruptions invade the stratosphere, they will form an aerosol layer all over the world, which will refract and absorb a large amount of sunlight causing the surface temperature to drop sharply and last for many years. When faced with a natural disaster such as a volcanic eruption, we should remain calm and take hedging measures to a certain extent. First, it's important to understand the basics of volcanic eruptions. A volcanic eruption refers to the release of a large amount of magma, volcanic gas, volcanic debris, water vapor and other materials from the interior of a volcano. According to research by volcanology experts, volcanic eruptions generally have the following precursors. Strong earthquakes have occurred in the area recently, the temperature near the volcano has increased and white smoke has appeared, cracks and other surface deformations have appeared on the mountain. If the above signs are observed, it means that the volcano is likely to erupt in the short term. Secondly, when a volcanic eruption is approaching or has begun, we should immediately pay attention to the Volcanic Disaster Emergency Plan issued by the authoritative department and carry out our own risk avoidance accurately and quickly according to the requirements of the plan. For residents near the volcanic eruption area, the safest way to avoid danger is to organize an evacuation immediately. You can choose to evacuate on foot or by vehicle if there is sufficient transportation. When evacuating, attention should be paid to maintaining order, helping the elderly, weak, sick and pregnant, and carrying necessary supplies to designated shelters or distant safe areas as soon as possible. At this time, you must not stay in the dangerous area for the sake of temporary convenience. More importantly, if the evacuation is not timely and you need to take shelter indoors, you should close the doors and windows to strengthen the ceiling of the house. At the same time, prepare necessities and protective equipment, such as food and drinking water, respirators, goggles, gas masks, radios, etc. It is best to temporarily mark the evacuation routes for each room indoors, and pay attention to the official progress of the volcanic eruption. If the house structure is damaged and you need to evacuate urgently, you must quickly flee to a relatively open area to avoid falling objects such as mountains and rocks flying from the volcano. At the same time, residents not near volcanic eruption areas should also increase their awareness of volcanic disaster prevention. Pay close attention to the spread trend and path of volcanic eruptions, and be prepared for protection and evacuation if necessary. If a large amount of volcanic ash or gas pollution occurs in a residential area, it should be temporarily evacuated as soon as possible. Drivers should be wary of traffic accidents caused by poor visibility, and walkers should also be careful of harmful substances in the air. In addition, it is necessary to prevent water sources, electricity and other facilities from being damaged and take emergency measures to ensure normal operation. In urban planning and design in areas prone to volcanic eruptions, the most important thing is the concept of disaster prevention and reduction. This means that the threat of volcanic disasters must be considered in land use and municipal infrastructure layout, so that the city has a certain ability to withstand disasters. First of all, in terms of land selection and land use, 
we must avoid the scope of active volcanic eruptions. It is not suitable to plan densely populated residential areas and important public facilities in these high-risk areas. Because once a volcanic eruption occurs, it will cause great losses to personnel safety and property. Instead, land away from the volcanoes was carefully developed to concentrate on building cities. Specifically, the volcanic area and a certain surrounding area can be classified as a transition zone for disaster prevention and reduction. In the overall urban planning and the construction of high-density buildings can be restricted. Secondly, it is necessary to determine safe transportation and logistics routes and evacuation channels based on the topographic and landform characteristics of the volcanic eruption-prone area. Highways, railways and air transportation facilities must consider the impact of secondary disasters such as volcanic debris, flows and ashfall, and try to guide them to areas with relatively minor disasters. The city's main evacuation routes should also avoid mountainous areas to ensure rapid evacuation of people in emergencies. More importantly, in terms of the layout of municipal infrastructure, it is necessary to prevent damage to water supply, power supply, heating, communications, medical care, fire prevention and other facilities caused by gas, volcanic debris and debris flows. These important lifeline facilities need to build necessary protective projects or adopt a decentralized distribution model in planning. Once a part is damaged, it can be quickly replaced by other parts, ensuring that the basic functions of the city can be quickly restored after a disaster.